OUP into becoming Pakistan's largest publishing house. Um, she's received the OBE uh, from the Queen for her contributions to promoting Anglo-Pakistani relations, women's rights and education. And um, she's going to lead us through this discussion with M.A. Farooqi and Jamil Ahmed. Thank you so much, Samina. Amina, sorry, and over to you. Good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure for me to be here today uh, with some outsp outstanding uh, speakers. Uh, I'm so sorry to inform you Hanif will not be here with us, but we do have two outstanding speakers, Mr. Jamil Ahmed, the author of The Wandering Falcon, uh, a book that was shortlisted for the Man Asia Literary uh, Prize in um, 2011, and it has also been shortlisted for the BSc Prize for South Asian Literature for, for 2013. Congratulations, Jamil Saab. Jal Jamil Ahmed was born in Jalandhar in 1933. As a member of the civil service of Pakistan, he served mainly in the frontier province and Balochistan. He was a political agent in Quetta, Chaghi, Khaibar, and Malakand. Later, he was commissioner in Dera Ismail Khan and Swat. He's also, he was also chairman of the Tribal Development Corporation and was posted as minister in Pakistan's embassy in Kabul at a critical time before and during the Soviet invasion of, of, of Afghanistan in 1979. Uh, Islamabad. Our other author here with us today is Mr. Musharraf Farooqi. Born in Hyderabad in 1968, Musharraf Farooqi has revived the famous dastans of Talisme Hoshriba and the adventures of Amir Hamza. He has also, uh, which he translated into English. He has also translated contemporary Urdu poet Afzal Ahmad Sayyid's poems and Urdu writer Sayyid Muhammad Ashraf's novel, The Beast. And uh, he has written children's fiction, the amazing mustaches of Muchandar, The Iron Man, Why Ants Don't Wear Shoes. His two uh, novels, the first one was um, A Story of a Widow, and the story of a widow was um, short for South Asian literature in 2009. His second novel, Between Clay and Dust, has been shortlisted for the Man, Man Asia Prize in 2012 and has been published by Alif uh, Book Company. Um, I think I'll begin with uh, a few questions uh, for Mr. Jamil Ahmed. Jamil Ahmed Saab, why did it take you 30 years to have your book published? Uh, I think uh, the publisher has accepted. I showed it around 30 years back to a few people. Um, uh, there were some suggestions. One suggestion was that they should use one of the chapters perhaps as a short story. Uh, by uh, an American magazine and I wasn't very keen. The second suggestion was from a British publisher who wanted to me to convert it into a non-fiction account about the tribes. That I was not willing to do. The third suggestion was that there was the dialogue in the book was archaic, quote unquote, and I should change it some into a somewhat modern idiom. Uh, that I thought was not right because tribes don't speak in the modern idiom. They speak, they have a tone, enunciation, cadence, uh, and traditional way of speaking. So I was not prepared to do, do that. So the book has been native for 30 years. was probably not, um, I think um, their aims and objectives were probably different. 
because I'm sure, as you said, I mean, today uh, um, it would have been a different um, story. But uh, what interested you or what propelled you on, uh, to write this novel? I think looking back, I was always interested in the tribes, even as a school child. Uh, I had no idea about the frontier tribes, but I mean, I was interested in the tribes of India, um, Sansis, uh, Odes. I was um, interested in the tribes of America, traditionally the Red Indians. I was interested in the tribes of the Fulanis and Hazas. Mashonas, Matabilis, then I was posted for a short time to what was then East Pakistan. I became interested in the Santhals and it continued. But when I was given a choice for my posting, I opted for the what was then called the Frontier List, service on the frontier. And I was lucky. I got that posting and I think I, that's one thing which was great in my life. I got the thing of my choice. And uh, I love that area. Uh, and then, of course, a lot of things happened. Then I had the free time. I started writing. And uh, my wife suggested I should write about the tribes. And I did. And that's how it is. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as you know, the the topic of this session is how tradition and honor, conspiracy and conflict are treat life and health. So Mr. Jamil Ahmed, I'd like to ask you about the concept of uh, honor, uh, which is so central to tribal customs and uh, uh, the value systems. So please can you enlarge on this and also comment on the manner in which the concept is uh, used as a tool to exploit, um, I think, um, the weaker sections of society, to exploit and oppress um, the weaker sections, are particularly women, and um, you know, social people regarded as social inferiors. I think um, uh, you have preempted, uh, 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 in a way, the judgment. Uh, I don't think it's a matter of exploitation. I don't think it's used as a tool of deliberate tool of uh, exploitation of women. I think the. Look at it, please look at it differently, Amina. I think honor is kind of a, lies within each person, man, woman, and child. He's born with it. But the concept, what it constitutes honor differs from person to person. Um, I was asked this question, if I may digress a bit, uh, by somebody only three months back uh, from a magazine in Rome. What is honor? And I was stumped. We use this word and we find it difficult to define it. So I looked up the dictionary and uh, there was, you know, respect, there was morality, there was, rec uh, you know, uh, rectitude. Uh, they didn't, you know, convey the meaning. What is honor? And I think the more I looked at some essays in the internet, it still didn't provide me the answer. So I thought a bit, and the closest I came to was, I think, a couple of lines from a play, probably it was A Man for All Seasons, which uh, stated that every person has a small island within himself which he will not, on which he will not permit any trespass. Now that island, that small island, is the one which matters. He can risk his life, he can risk his... Uh, property, he can risk his lives of his dear one, he can li uh, risk everything to protect that small island. Now that's where the, I think you look back, I mean the other sort of aspect is that in the old, old days traditionally, you see man's word, man I mean women also, uh, there were no documents, there were no court record, there were no rules and regulations and systems. So the man's word was very, very important. His commitment, I mean, it's mentioned in the scriptures, it's mentioned in the religious tracts. Uh, oath was very important. Now, that's where I think the genesis of honor probably lies, that two things combine, that 
you know, a man's ought, person's ought, his sense of right and wrong, the core of that sense is what is honor. It's not a tool of exploitation, Amina, I don't agree with you. Well, I think um, uh, clearly you uh, have a great understanding of the tribal way of life and their customs and um, uh, systems. Um, and uh, you have written, this way of life constituted defiance to certain concepts which the world was beginning to associate with civilization itself. Concepts such as statehood, citizenship, undivided loyalty to one state, settled life as opposed to uh, nomadic life. So are you suggesting that these traditional concepts are incompatible with the modern life and with citizenship of a modern state? I think it um, goes back much further. You see, a uh, tribal gene is embedded in each one of us, each one of us, even today. And tribe is the core, is the basic building block, I feel. I'm not a trained anthropologist, but I feel that the tribe is the basic building block of human civilization. It's, it probably came about even before the human humans started pairing. This is the basic building block. Now, you look back also and you find that every other form of collectivity, feudal system, nation states, uh, consumer capitalist society, I mean all along, you could, you know, lots and lots. There has been an adversary relationship between the tribe and any, every other form of collectivity. I mean, the oldest I can think of probably is uh, Caesar's campaign in Gaul. I mean, that's a written account. And even 2,000 years ago, uh, tribes have struggled because every system is jealous, envious, uh, feels threatened by the tribe. And even today, you see it many, you know, um, the same feeling of a little bit of uh, uh, anger with the tribe for no reason. Tribes have been on the defensive all along. But then they have struggled for a long time. And uh, I think that they, if you can provide protection to birds and plants and animals, Please protect the tribe. They need to be protected. Um, so, in that case, uh, Jamil Saab, I mean, are you, uh, in a way, supporting uh, tribal values and um, attitudes towards such concepts as honor? I mean, I, you do approve of them? In, in I do, I do. I think that of all the forms of collectivity, I think every, every collectivity has a little tyranny inbuilt into it. Even if, a, you know, if a, even if it's a husband and wife, and they, there is a bit of tyranny here in. And tribal, tribe as a system has the least amount of tyranny uh, imposed upon its members. I, think I that, favor the tribe. That's why I think the women in your book, uh, The Wandering Falcon, are, are far from being shrinking violets. I think they're very strong-willed and very assertive. Uh, and yet, the stereotype is that women living in such societies are meek and docile. Uh, so what is the source of strength of women um, in, your, in your mind? I think uh, the first story, I don't know how many of you have read the book, but the first story uh, actually is, of course it is true that, you know, the woman suffers, so does the man. But I think the basic point is that an oath was taken, you know, whether it is marriage oath, uh, and unfortunately, uh, rightly or wrongly, the tribal rules, systems, taboos, rights and wrongs, protect the oath when it's taken in any form. And here was a marriage oath which the woman broke. And unfortunately, I mean, you may, I sympathize with her, because I've seen this happening. You know, the tower standing in the desert, twin towers. Men and 
women still fall in love despite the terror men visible over the skyline they still fell in love but that is what the first story tends to portray that you know unfortunately sometimes the rules go wrong but they are there I think uh, moving away from women uh, I'm just talking about the locals the peasants the nomads the common folk they cling on to tradition like an anchor is that um, so do you think that they should continue doing that or should they try to um, come out of this culture and move into the mainstream I have no recipe for them I'm just describing what happened before my eyes if the uh, migratory people who had been migrating backward and forward for god knows how long the uh, 1000 years 2000 years suddenly found their path blocked their way of life ended up being destroyed and there's a mass of people i mean in those areas in the highlands of afghanistan who used to travel right up to calcutta in their annual migration and go back it was a way of life but then uh, there are terrible tragedies happening all the time in history and this is one of them and i don't think it can ever be reversed because nation states that told you tribes have suffered nation states have dominated they are uh, on the verge of victory so that's why i plead for the uh, protection of the tribe please think about them and they need to be protected um yes absolutely but you know they have been exploited by their own tribal leaders and by the state I think the uh, meaning you have not lived in the tribal areas because the exploitation takes place much more in the consumer capitalist society in the cities in the villages in the uh, you know feudal areas and uh, then it takes place anywhere else yes absolutely yes, yes. but except that you know in um, you know in settled areas in big cities there is this chance to get education to start thinking um, and to some extent to be able to uh, think independently and stand on their own feet no, but without they, education how are they supposed i think there's a difference between literacy and education i think probably in some cases tribes are more educated they may not be literate yeah. mm, yes absolutely so do you see literature as a huge and growing data bank of recorded life and its experiences and the thoughts that sorry. they have given rise to sorry a uh, literature just coming uh, do you think literature Do you see it as a huge and growing data bank of recorded lives and experiences that you have uh, that you have had, uh, which result in a um, greater understanding of uh, of life and uh, you know human action in the reader? I think I think it's a responsibility with every single young man and woman because a lot of data, a lot of narratives, a lot of history is. has been unrecorded uh, and is disappearing there is no record and each one of us needs to write down uh, for the subsequent generations my wife tells me why don't you write i said i don't have it is it even if you doesn't get published write it for your children for your grandchildren um, but you know don't waste your time i can't do it but but i think each one of us needs one of us needs to report something Yes absolutely and I think you've added a great deal to the body of knowledge um, known as literature um now the traditions and the code of honor that you observed uh, in the society were you sort of doing research for for writing a book or was the book the outcome of your interest in them and the Baloch tribal society to which they belonged I was doing no no, no research but you these things hit me uh, small things they're not a part of the book uh, may I narrate a small incident uh, i was in this place where the first story is based it's a place called chavai and uh, 
I narrated it to my brother and others, so please don't forgive me for repeating it. But um, there, were, there was a tennis court. There were only four tennis players in the whole of 20,000 square miles of desert. Sometimes you four would get, happen to get together and, and you would fix a game of tennis. We were playing tennis on that day and there was a locust attack. Uh, the sky darkened, we broke up the tennis game, I started going back, uh, climbing to my small, there was a pimple of a hill on, on which my house was located, trying to walk back. And I found some 10 year olds, 12 year olds, young boys, running about a uh, patch of green, which was called the political agent's garden, with scraggly cauliflowers and things like that. And I found that levies were chasing those boys. The, I said, why are you chasing them? They said, they're running about in your garden. So I called, said for the levies to get me my official paper, my office seal, pen, and I wrote a permit to the leader of those boys. I said, what's your name? I said, and I said, so and so is entitled to catch locus in the political agents garden in perpetuity. So, 20 years or more later, I was chief secretary in Balujusan, and a man walks up in his 20s and, you know, into my office, he was conducted into the office, what's it? He said, I'm sure you don't recognize me. I said, no, I don't. He pulled out a piece of paper from his pocket. He said, you gave me this permit when I was 10 years old and I didn't thank you. I have come to thank you for this permit. No, that, that was tribal area. I mean, surely you can't forget this kind of thing. And that is also perhaps, you know, the sense of honor of, those, uh, of the tribe. Think about it. Jamil Sahib, you have written with a great deal of understanding and affection of the tribal society of uh, Baluchistan. Um, would you have any regrets if it, is, uh, if it changes and adopts mo uh, modern values or moves into the mainstream? No, it's been destroyed. I mean, it started, you know, it was on the way to destruction when very massive forces, uh, the tensions between East and West, the tent, the one war, the, the, uh, you know, the clash between communism and the Western interest, and the tribes became a pawn in that struggle. And they, you know, I think that was the road to disaster. And the follow-up of today's tribes in that area I'm talking about, perhaps in Africa also, perhaps in Central America. Uh, have, uh, I think, uh, are in great danger of destruction. I think you've made a, a great contribution by writing about a uh, culture about which very little is known and actually even less is, is uh, recorded. So do you think that um, truth and integrity, uh, integrity and um, a sort of uh, faith, faithfulness to one's oath uh, are they more a part of the tribal culture than modern society in the subcontinent? No, it's, a, it's not sort of a very clear picture about, you know, that the tribal society is always right and the, the non-tribal society is always a, a villain. No, I think that basically it depends from individual uh, to individual. I all believe in individuals, but I'll, even in tribal society, you see, you... Um, there is treachery, there is betrayal, there is, um, uh, you know, things happen. But um, the tribal society uh, has, you know, in a way, um, it doesn't cause uh, major trauma, it handles those things well enough, and it doesn't get handled as well in the other forms of society. I mean, do our uh, systems, uh, are they more effective than the tribal systems? 
As I'm mean, not today's tribal systems, because today tribal systems are under great pressure, but you know, 50 years back, they were handling this well enough. Thank you, Jamil Sahib. I think uh, that really your understanding, your insights, uh, and your affection uh, of the customs and tradition of this tribal culture, uh, I think you've done a wonderful job as a writer to record those for future generations uh, and add to the body of literature. And you have preserved and protected these from slipping away into obscurity. I hope, um, just the last question that um, I hope this is not your first and last book and that you are working on something else. I don't have the energy. Probably. I might sort of, you know, if I get out of this, you know, what's, uh, I, you, you know, I had a fall and I damaged my muscles. But uh, let me, you know, get over this and then uh, we'll see. Well, I think we'll all look forward to um, Another book from you, Jameet Saab, and I hope you recover quickly Thank from your knee injury. Thank you. Um, I'll just uh, move on to... Uh, um, Musharraf Ali Faruti, thank you for being here today. Thank you, Mina. Um, as I said, uh, Musharraf's first book, The Story of a Widow, was shortlisted for the DSC Prize for South Asian Literature in 2009. And his second book, Between Clay and uh, Dust, has been shortlisted for the Man Asia Lit uh, Literary Prize 2011. Between Clay and Dust is a novel set in an unnamed city in the north of the subcontinent and features two formerly skilled practitioners of ancient crafts who are now past their primes, the wrestler Ustad Ramzi and the courtesan Gohar Jahan. As is clear, the professions are also age-old and are evolving in ways that the, that the two of them cannot cope with. The central theme of your book is thus tradition. So Musharraf, uh, in your novel Between Clay and Dust, your knowledge of the Pehlwan culture and traditions is very impressive. But your antecedents don't include uh, links with the Pehlwan society. So where did you get your insights from? Can empirical uh, research alone pri provide the dimensions that turn information uh, to actually, literary subject matter? Actually, there are antecedents. Uh, I used to wrestle with my younger brother, and you know, so that that got me into it. Um, but really, uh, this getting into uh, a very a strict code of life like the Palawans have uh, is not easy and I would have been completely at a loss had I not found uh, a book called the Dastane Shazorani Baris, which is essentially which means the history of uh, the wrestlers of the subcontinent. And I found that book just by by chance because I uh, do my research on the, the Dastan, that's the genre that I translate from. and. Um, I was looking for the books on the Dastan, and somebody at uh, the uh, Toronto Robarts Library had mis uh, uh, placed, I mean, they, they had just mis uh, catalogued this book as Dastan because you know, they saw the name Dastan and they thought, you know, it's not history, but it's actually the Dastan genre. So they put it with the Dastan books, and that's how I discovered this book. But, uh, and, and you know, then that was my entry into the world of the Panamans, but before that, even before the novel started, uh, it was I had in mind an idea to explore what the feminine that the Palwan uh, that we call Palwan is, and it was initially going to be just maybe a two-page essay, uh, a Borghesian essay, you know, like he's written about Shakespeare, you know, the essence of Shakespeare, so something like that. But as I read about that, and you know, I uh, began to think about these characters, and I read about their histories. There, um, I began to see them uh, moving in their actual their, uh, physical space. And when you see somebody in, in a physical space, suddenly that world comes alive. And you, uh, from, you know, from that space to human relationships and how they conduct, it with, uh, conduct themselves with each other is, is just you know, uh, natural. And that's how the story grew and, and became uh, the novel that uh, is called between clay and dust. The fading uh, Pehlwan culture, I think like the tribal culture of Mr. Jamil Ahmed's book, 
seems uh, to have had its own sense of uh, a very strong sense of honor. Do you think this is the hallmark of all past and dying cultures, or do um, you think uh, new cultures evolve of, with their own codes of honor? I, I call uh, Pahlwani or you know wrestling as we call uh, as we know it uh, in the subcontinent. Uh, not uh, not ma merely a sport, but uh, it 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 is a way of life. Because you know, uh, sportsmen they go off training sometimes. You know, there there are times when even boxers, who are uh, some of the toughest um, athletes, they go off their training for uh, for periods of one month, two months, three months. But the pehlwans they never discontinue what they do. They they still get up at three or four in the morning. They you know they go through their um, exercises. And it's it's a it's a way of life for them, um, and to um, and and that that is still exists. For example, in Gujaranwala and even in South of, uh, in South India, it's not uh, Balwani is not just limited to uh, North India. Even in the South, there's a very strong tradition of uh, Balwani and physical and martial arts. So uh, this just you know um, it's uh, as a culture as you know it it may have lost the prominence that it once enjoyed. When, uh, when the rajas and maharajas and the princely states were there, and they would, uh, they would, uh, you know, patronize them. But now uh, it's become more focused on surviving. So you know that, that then, and and you know, with the sense of survival comes a sense of compromise. And this, you know, this novel uh, deals with the with that, you know, that compromise and the conflicts that arise from that. Uh, Musharraf, the characters in your book, uh, the aging wrestler and the pastor prime courtesan of the wife, are both committed to the traditions of their occupations. Ustad Ramzi still um, perfumes and kneads the clay of the akhara, and uh, uh, Gohar Jahan still performs the morning riyas. Are they not slaves to tradition? To what extent were they, in fact, exploited by traditional society? And are they becoming... Um, Irrelevant anachronisms today. Um, I will say this um, not so much for the Pelwans, but for the Tawaifs, uh, uh, who used to be an institution, and uh, they were not prostitutes in the sense we understand uh, the Tawaif today, but uh, they were closer to the concept of the geisha, the Japanese uh, courtesan, and it was a culture into itself. Uh, and many of you know what you call polite society, you know members of the polite society would uh, be in attendance at their quotas, and the, uh, they were not there merely to you know enjoy the physical charms of um, of that particular woman. They were there as as members of an elite, and it was you know uh, you, we have the French tradition of the salons and whatnot, and these some of these uh, uh, tawaifs were. Artists in more senses than one. I mean, they were they were great poets. Some of them, some of them were uh, amazing dancers, singers. So they were not treated as as flesh, which which we now uh, consider them consider them to be. They were treated as equals, and they acted as equals. You know, there were people who would not be allowed entrance. You know, if they stepped out of you know. You know, a certain code of the quota, and no matter you know if they were rajas or the maharajas, they would be denied entry. So you know, this kind of uh, culture would not have occurred without you know that uh, being a respectable and a venerable institution in itself. But coming back to your to to, uh, to answer your question, yes, once the once that prominence was lost by the courthouse, and again you know the when the, after the disintegration of the princely states and after they were given back uh, after they, they merged. And something you know, which uh, Mr. Jimmy Lamas said, you know, just like the tribes uh, are under threat, you know, with, with this under this force of you know what we call modernity. Um, this the, the concept of nation state it uh, took away a lot of the licenses which were enjoyed by the principal states, maybe for you know some very good purposes. And as a result, they had to fend for themselves. And again, then the compromise came. But Gohardan, looking at this, you know, the wife sitting at somebody who had grown up with the sense that this court has going to be there and I'm going to be present at the court whether or not I'm an active uh, practitioner of this art I will pass on my tradition to the next generation of the wives and the next and the next so when this world is eliminated and is no longer there then there's this sudden sense of complete loss and confusion I mean 
how do you cope with with the sense that you know your world has been completely taken away all all its all its coordinates have been uh, you know lost and and you are you know, you're just there um, staring at, at this you know light which is you know uh, coming into your eyes and you are unable to make any sense of of the present reality so in that sense because as institutions both pahlwani and and the kotha were dependent on 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 patronage of uh, of the uh, of the princely states they were uh, they were um, i mean uh, they were compromised from uh, in their very essence and when that thing uh, happened when the partition happened they they were you know left they they disintegrated in, in many senses i think in many ways your uh, your characters are similar to uh, jamil ahmed saab's characters because they do have um, they are they stick to their principles like gohar jahan like um, um the the wrestler uh, ramzi um so you but i find uh, that um, clearly i mean the kotha culture and i wonder if you'd like to comment on how the kotha culture has changed in lahore's uh, hira mandi and in karachi's napier road where these places were declared illegal and then uh, they were not uh, they didn't come to an end the activities of the kotha culture but they spread out through through the whole city but i think then it sort of moved from um, a dedication to music and art and culture uh, more to an exploitation of the female body would you agree with that um well i have not been there recently uh, i've been there you know as a reader uh, the history of the kotha but uh, I'll tell you what happened recently. I've moved away from Karachi. You know, I actually ran away from Karachi to, you know, write in peace in Lahore. So I'm based in Lahore, which is, you know, the home of many kotas. And uh, a friend of mine, um, Rafi Alam, you know, he took us. He took me on a round of uh, of the old city, and we passed by these lanes, small lanes, uh, which had kotas, you know, on the upper stories, and and all the uh, the shops at the lower level were selling fish and tikkas and all that. and we were not there i mean the main attraction for us was the tikkas and the fish which we ate so you know uh, that romance of the court has gone we uh, it, it has degenerated to the level that there was not even uh, you know this sense of curiosity to you know go in and take a look to see you know what uh, state they are in we were there you know just for masala fish and you know besan with the leavy machine you know that that's what uh, we were there for We should have just one question on your, your book, uh, Story of a Widow, and then we'll uh, move on to questions and answers from the audience. The character is a uh, is a middle-aged woman who has the strength of will to confront the tragedy of widowhood, uh, and she actually defies uh, conventions and she defies her children and society, and goes in for a remarriage, and and, and then later she chooses divorce. Yeah, just told the story. <laughs> <laughs> but do why the book is still well what is the source of her strength <laughs> the you see uh, the source of her strength is we we do a lot of things um to defy somebody in life whether it's our husband or wives or parents and or you know the nation state as you know uh, some of us do and you know we step out of it and say you know we don't you know agree with this um so uh, her uh, reaction to to just the, you know the proposal from this unsuitable gentleman uh, the family's reaction to you know his proposal to her was such that she felt that she's going to you know um sock it to them as the expression goes and that's you know that's why she she took the steps that she did and that that actually took her to another uh, stage in her life which you know was uh, a different kind of experience but you know that's initially it was you know just to defy everyone oh i'm sorry i gave away the ending of your book but here it is a wonderful book a great read so do buy it um any questions um i think the lady in the back with the black uh, sweater
man troubled by his conscience. Conscience is like a poor man living in a rich man's house. It has to remain cheerful at all times for fear of being thrown out. Our cause is right because we think it is right, but never depend on your conscience. Yours or another man's. Uh, where does this paragraph come from? And if you can't rely on our conscience, what... what um, I'm sorry, I couldn't uh, get it that nearly enough. Uh, uh, you wrote a paragraph about consciousness, people's ah, yes, conscience, right. and whether or not it is uh, useful or not. So I was wondering if you agree with that. That, let me confess, is uh, something which came to my mind which, uh, of its own because I've seen human behavior. And you know, in Urdu, say, uske zameer ne mulamat ki. And I felt, you know, uh, you know, I came, think, thought about it, twenties, maybe uh, early thirties. That I've never seen a man haunted by his conscience. He has been able to do the most vicious things, and and I've seen them, you know, justifying it. Oh, he did it to me. Oh, he did this, and the most vicious things have been done. And the conscience is, you know. Uh, in literature, in poetry, in, I mean, it, that doesn't exist really, almost uh, doesn't exist. So I thought that, you know, it, this story, when it related to uh, uh, two contenders, uh, you see the old man, I showed that, show that he's, you know, uh, there is wisdom in uh, the tribal people. They understand, uh, you know, this came from his lips, that conscience doesn't mean much. It only, it only means, it's a word in literature, it's a word in poetry, it's a word perhaps in scriptures, but in actual human lives, unfortunately, it counts for very little. Does that answer your question? No. Uh, I think uh, it is subject to a uh, different opinion there can be. And in your earlier things, you have justified uh, the tribal system and values as if they should not come into terms with modernity. What are the negative effects that you find uh, with modernity? And the second question to uh, another uh, book, See, the, the whole situation in the world where the flesh has uh, gone into the background and the art has gone into the background from Kotha culture, I feel because of the cinema and availability and our moving toward the permissive system in a way, I mean, compare, like Western world, that has made a different thing altogether, the whole story of Kotha culture. And Professor Yusuf asked me. You will pardon my... Uh perhaps enunciating the uh, response uh, the way I'm doing it. But this is what I was talking about when Amina asked me a question. I said, the harassment which the tribes have faced uh, has been, it's a long story, 3,000 years. And today, it's, it's a kind of a verbal assault when without understanding, without, you know, uh, what is a tribe, what does it constitute, what, what are its limitations, what are its, uh, what is its, uh, uh, what is it, has it offered the world. Uh, we go on, go on for a, to make a case for social engineering of the tribes without even understanding the tribes. The tribe, the tribe, and you, I'm sure that you, when you are asking this question, there is still a tribal gene embedded somewhere. And under the certain, some certain set of circumstances, I assure you that gene will emerge once again. But I, you may, you are entitled to your views, uh, but Please don't enforce them on the people who don't want to live by your rules. Uh -huh. uh, 
I, I, I need to compliment Musharraf for the excellent book uh, um, between Heath and us. Uh, thanks so much for giving us uh, a, such a beautiful etching of the two characters, Musharraf. Uh, I was really interested in knowing uh, if you heard back from either of the communities on what they thought about what you did. Um, I'd never seen an Akhara, you know, the clay pit or the wrestlers where the wrestlers uh, live. And uh, the book was launched in April, and in June it had its launch uh, on the first of June in Lahore. So um, I went to Nakara with a friend uh, who, who was handling the publicity of the book, and I stepped into Nakara for the very first time. And uh, I spoke to the Pelwans. I said, you know, I've written a book about Pelwans. Oh, you've written a book? I said, yes. He said, where's the book? I said, I'll give it to him. So he. Flip through the pages, say, Where are the pictures? <laughs> and is my family mentioned in it? So uh, I said, Yes, the mention of your family is there, which was not, but you know, I had to, you know, make him happy or something. And uh, but I said, You know, the pictures, you know, the publishers, you know, they skin on everything, you know, they took out the pictures, but you know, they were also there. <laughs> so that, that was the reaction. And the quote has, You know, I just go there to eat fish. So. Um, uh, my question is to Musharraf. Uh, thanks for clarification. Why did you go to the court? Uh, 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 while collecting uh, materials for writing a book and while uh, writing a book, uh, uh, Musharraf uh, Manto has written a lot about court uh, culture and uh, many of uh, his characters are Tabai and all. Uh, while writing the book, uh, how much influence uh, uh, does Manto have on movies at all? Any? Um, I consider Manto a second-rate writer. Uh, so I don't read him for influences. What I find Manto's strengths are his ability to create a gallery of characters uh, of a time which, of which we know increasingly little. Because uh, in Pakistan, where you know he was at the end of his uh, days and where he was writing, uh, he uh, was living a life which is no longer acceptable to uh, you know uh, even the liberals who champion his cause. And uh, so Manto had, you know, a um, I, I look at Manto differently. Um, but what I did uh, read carefully was Mr. Ghulam Abbas's Anandi, you know, which is one of his uh, masterpieces. And, you know, it deals about, you know, the culture of the Tawaifs and how it grows and how it's marginalized and, uh, you know, uh, their efforts to shut it down. And then it, you know, starts somewhere else with the, in the same manner because, you know, our instincts are essentially, you know, have not changed over centuries. So, um, Urdu literature, they, uh, I did read Umrao Janada, you know, which is the story of uh, Tawaif, and uh, I did read Sharif Zada, which is his other novel. So, I, I, did, I did read those, you know, to get some kind of sense. But still, you know, um, there is, you, you cannot really have a, a sense of that from reading. Uh, you know, just like, it, uh, you cannot, uh, I mean, Dickens wrote so, so many books and about Victorian England and whatnot, and you uh, you just uh, read that and you know it's a kind of sense grows, but we still have not you know lived that. Uh, if I were to write a book about Victorian England, you know, I'm, I'm totally at loss. So it, it's a different you know that influence. It does influence you in a certain way, but again you know it does not. It, it cannot. You, it's it's really a struggle and a challenge. Yes, please. Uh, I'm so much from uh, uh, JNK. Harif Sahib, I would like to know whether this wisdom of tribes, we have a lot many tribes in the state of JNK, can this tribal wisdom really help us find a solution in the region, especially in JNK? Solution, uh, I think the problems were immense, but I think the, problem, the solution, there is no quick solution today. Uh, I think um, for what it's nothing to do with the book, but I have always felt that when I was growing up, the greatest influences were the school teachers and the parents. Uh, you grew up, uh, the way you grew up, I think that, that sort of uh, influence, and the collective influence uh, uh, came about because the parents all conformed to a certain standard, the teachers all conformed to certain, this is in the cities. In the tribal areas, it was simpler. I mean, in the cities, it was, the task was more difficult. But in the tribal areas, I thought they had an easier time. 
the guardians, the parents, because the collectivity itself could form certain standards uh, which made the tasks of the guardians easier. Now the tribes are getting shattered, so I, we can't say that you know you simply transfer the tribal standard uh, to the cities and it will work. No, it won't, because there are tribes are getting shattered, they're getting battered, and and I think task will have to be taken from the earlier stage by the teachers and the parents. That would be the right way of looking at. I don't think the tribals can do, tribal system can do much simply by trying to re-engineer re the city populations. It's not that easy. And by, have I answered your question? Last question. My question is to uh, Denise. I, I'm right here in the front. Yeah. Oh, sir. I, I would like to ask you whether you felt that the uh, Tell us, share a little bit with us the approach to language that you experience with the tribals. How is their approach to language and how did you see that change over the years? I hope I can make, you know, give a short answer. When I went into the tribal areas, uh, I chose this specialist service. I think the requirement was carried over from the previous 50 years of this service that you had to learn, I, I mean, I had to learn Pashto because I was, you know, I was tasked for the Pashto speaking areas. And uh, you had to pass an examination, both written and oral, and otherwise you were kicked out after six months. You had to do it within six months. So I had to get a tutor, I had to have a conversation. And rightly or wrongly, at one point, I acted myself as the examiner of Pashto for the other. Uh, but the incentive was that you got an allowance of 100 rupees a month added to your pay if you passed that examination. Now, 100 rupees was a fantastic sum in those days, and uh, that was uh, the second incentive. So I have managed to do that. And the added to that was that for every additional language you passed, you know, Balochi, Brohi, Persian, these are the languages in those areas you got a lump sum honorarium. But I did only one language, Pashto. Uh, though I served in the Baloch areas, but I was able to manage uh, with a bit of Persian because I had done Persian in school. So I was able to do uh, manage, but Pashto was my basic extra language. Thank you very much, Mr. Jamil Hemad and Mr. Musharraf Ali Farooqi. And thank you for joining us. And thank you, Amina. Thank you so much. As a small token of our appreciation, we'd like to gift you all a scarf from the festival to keep you warm on Jaipur nights. Mohammed Hanif can shiver. <laughs>